welcome and thank you okay. so much, Professor mm -hmm. Wallace. Um, an introduction on who you are. You're an experienced educator teaching the Master of Public Administration and Master of Business Administration. Candidates at Colum Columbia University Schools of International and Public Affairs, Medgar Evers College, Metropolitan College of New York's School of Public Affairs, Pace University, John Jay College, and La Universidad Externado, Colombia. That's really cool. This is a, a citizen of the world, a global citizen. And Professor Ford began his studies at Dartmouth College and finished up his degree at Harvard Law School and has dedicated much of his life's work to ad addressing issues of racial justice, inequality, and systemic racism during his work in government, academia, and the private sector. Professor Ford has extensive experience in both the public and private sectors. In the public sector, he's held positions such as President of the State of New York Mortgage Agency and Deputy Commissioner of the New York State Department of Commerce. In the private sector, he's managed a venture capital company, worked as an investment banker, and as an international corporate attorney. As an attorney and a consultant, his clients have included the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the Irish Stock Exchange, Bloomberg LLC, Black Entertainment Television, and more. Professor Ford had, was born in Harlem and educated in Japan, Puerto Rico, and the United States. He's a graduate of Dartmouth College, where he was a senior fellow and received his Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School. And Professor Ford currently resides in Harlem. So Professor Ford, as you know, you and I have a point of similarity, and I wish I could claim that I was a Harvard grad, but we both lived in Japan, so we've, we've got that, that shared background. And we're so incredibly pleased. Today you're going to be Absolutely. talking. Yes, we're going to be talking about how to address um, the current racial unrest, you know, which has all of this tension layered on top of an already tense society. So we're really grateful for what you have to share, and I would love to pass the floor to you. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. It was kind of like walking down memory lane, uh, but uh, it's, all, it's all good uh, for sure on this uh, Tuesday, Bastille Day, right? So uh, how apropos, I guess, uh, for, for us to be having this particular discussion. Uh, my plan was, uh, and you know, in terms of today's presentation, and as we are looking at you know, these issues of, of, uh, in this notion of a learning environment, uh, that uh, how we can look at addressing uh, both racial and social unrest, which in these United States is pretty much intertwined. And uh, and what I wanted to do is, is a couple of things, uh, which I will do uh, with um, you uh, with with our audience here. Is you've given you've been kind enough to give um, you know my biographical background. I want to kind of connect the dots with respect to that background, with respect to this whole issue of addressing racial and social unrest, and uh, then really give some, uh, what I think is a useful historical background with respect to um, what the sources are, the roots are, the seeds are of racial and social unrest here in uh, these United States. And um, I wish I could then say, and in, in conclusion, I will provide all of the solutions and so we can all walk out of here. But what I can do is um, provide some perspective on uh, what I believe would be positive activity, constructive activity, useful activity in addressing um, uh, that, those same concerns, racial and social unrest. And so, um, you know, for, for example, and as I said, there's certainly no need to recount resume information again, but you mentioned uh, that I am a member of the faculty of the Department of Public Administration at Medgar College, which is a part of the City University of New York, the largest urban university in America and one of the largest urban uh, universities in the world. Uh, Edgar Evers College is uh, designated as a predominantly black institution. Everybody certainly is aware of the term the HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. Medgar Evers was not uh, formed until, was not established until 1970s, so we don't make the historical cut. 
uh, for being an historically black college and university, uh, university, but we are a predominantly black institution. It's called a PBI. And why is that important? Because of the various teaching experiences that you mentioned I have, I've been teaching at Medgar Evers College uh, for uh, going on seven years now. And um, I think it's really important uh, to make sure that the higher education experience, particularly uh, for young black men and black women, uh, includes uh, perspectives that uh, might not always be available at other institutions because people aren't paying attention in, uh, to those concerns. It really is, um, you, know, you know, Ralph Ellison wrote back, you know, over, you know, 60 years ago, The Invisible Man. And in many ways, although, you know, black people are certainly very much a part of American society, uh, the concerns that we have, the issues that we have aren't always addressed. For example, uh, the, um, I mentioned that Medgar College is a predominantly black institution. Uh, it also has a uh, population that's about 75% female. And you say, well, gee, that's a pretty uh, large number. I guess that's a good thing, certainly, in terms of as many young black women as possible have access to higher education. But one could also ask, well, where are the guys? Okay, and where the guys are is, is this is the consequence of um, what uh, has been re referenced as um, you know, uh, the new Jim Crow, incarceration nation, if you will. You can't, you have mass incarceration taking place uh, for several decades now, and you keep scooping the 18 to 34 year old uh, cohort of young men out of the uh, college pool, if you will, you wind up with a situation like we have here now. And it's not that all these young men are doing 10 to 20 in Sing Sing. Uh, what it means is that if you get any kind of criminal record uh, for what, what we might even call social um, differences, what we might call uh, you know, uh, uh, discretionary arrests and uh, convictions, um, that you then can't get federal aid uh, for education. Somebody's you know, overwhelming wisdom when the uh, various uh, tough on crime uh, bills were passed, uh, there was this decision to make sure that uh, uh, not only are people punished by going to prison for inordinate periods of time, uh, not only would people not be able to get in certain kinds of employment uh, once they were released uh, from prison, but also that they couldn't pursue a college education with uh, federal support through programs such as the Pell Grants. I would like to highlight for um, uh, those who are listening right now, watching, and listening is that at both of those uh, schools, I was uh, fortunate to be able to lead the Black Student Organization, first at Dartmouth and, and then at Harvard. And uh, during that time, we didn't, we didn't just attend, we didn't just go to the football games and the concerts. We also engaged in systemic change with respect to issues like enrollment of Black students. Which is, again, when I was at Harvard Law School, same thing, talking about enrollment issues, uh, faculty issues, uh, as well as curriculum issues. And my point in making uh, that is that for those people who are uh, you know, participating in today's conference, uh, I want you know, people to know whether they're on the younger side of the spectrum or the older side of the spectrum, there's ways to be creative to address these disparities and concerns once we recognize that there are disparities and concerns. And um, I'll get into that a little bit uh, further as we go along, uh, because um, what I wanna try to recite is not my life's work so much as um, how that ties into this whole question of addressing uh, racial inequities, disparities, and I guess what we, you know, some people would also term as just outright racism. Uh, because when I was um, working um, for the um, uh, you know, city of New York, for example. Uh, one of the things that I was, I was able to do and fortunate to do is uh, as the commissioner for business services, we got involved in establishing a minority women's business program so that the city, when it was purchasing whatever it was, uh, construction supplies, educational supplies, pencils, whatever it might be, that they would also include uh, black businesses in that process, which you'd say, well, just in the natural course of things, wouldn't that be the case? In the natural course of things in these United States of America, uh, the answer is no. It have to be mandates. There have to be actual um, guidance so that these kinds of things take place. And in a relatively short period of time, we put together uh, the city's largest, uh, excuse me, the nation's largest municipally based um, uh, minority women's business program. And um, I'm proud to say that uh, when I was working then for New York City's first and only black mayor when he left office, uh, the infamous Rudy Giuliani, 
uh, became mayor of the city of New York. And his first act was to disband the program that I was pleased to be a part of. I took that as a badge of honor because if Rudy Giuliani didn't like it, and I'm pretty sure we were doing a pretty damn good job. You know, and so, but it's, but it's a struggle even to this day. Um, what we see in New York City, for example, is that in the midst of this pandemic, there's been extraordinary purchases of whether it's PPEs by the city or various food resources and transportation resources as part of pandemic response. And the participation of um, black businesses is 1%. And so we know that there's still a lot of work to do and that without those mandates, without that guidance, without that oversight, it still doesn't happen because it's not the natural order of things in these United States. Now, as I said, um, you know, uh, what I wanted to just, you know, provide some context for my remarks and um, what I've, you know, uh, I'm 70 years old now and, uh, you know, over for over a half a century, you know, I'd, li I'd like to believe that I've dedicated myself to principles of justice and equity uh, for Black Americans, which in the course of equity and justice for Black Americans, all Americans uh, wind up participating in that process. And what do I mean by that? I'm not, you know, you know suggesting any magical uh, thinking. What I do mean by that is that uh, because the inequities and the, uh, the discrimination and the outright racism that has been directed at Black Americans since um, first Africans were brought to this country enslaved in 1619, to the extent that you loosen those bonds, to the extent that, uh, that the uh, society begins to think in terms of fairness, in terms of equity, uh, you start to see a number of other changes take place. Two, I'll, I'll, I'll point uh, more than two. Uh, a couple that I'll point out but from a historical standpoint. Uh, the um, 15th Amendment was passed uh, in the early 1870s, which gave um, black males the right to vote. Uh, you shouldn't need to have had that, but of course, uh, because of the efforts to prevent um, what was in a, the franchise for voting uh, was a male province uh, in and of itself, um, that, uh, that gave rise, ultimately, the 15th Amendment gave rise to the 20th Amendment. To the Constitution, and you know that took another uh, 45 years. Uh, but the point was that the um, the 15th Amendment served as the precedent for the 20th Amendment, which quote gave uh, women the right to vote. And um, indeed, um, that was it. That was that. We kind of see where, as as justice begins to rise, uh, kind of all boats rise with it. Consider the civil, you know, the civil rights movement, which I can. People look at the civil rights movement in past tense, I would suggest to say that it's been an ongoing process since 1619. But during uh, some of the major events of the civil rights movement, particularly the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, particularly the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that gave rise to a number of issues with respect to gender e equity uh, throughout the United States, which uh, didn't just benefit black women, it benefited white women, Asian women, Latino women, uh, women uh, from, uh, from the indigenous people and so on. Um, it gave rise to the uh, ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, consider the fact that, you know, if you just go back into these, uh, you know, in the time past, uh, prior to 1970, uh, no buildings were being built with uh, disability, uh, people with disabilities or differently abled people in mind. Uh, no concerns were being made in terms of any special societal uh, efforts to address people with those concerns. But as this notion of equity and justice uh, began to go forward, we start to see uh, you know, benefits taking place there. The LGBTQ community uh, benefits from that whole process as well. Consider the fact that uh, you could go to prison uh, for um, being openly gay, if I use the term uh, loosely in that regard, in many, many, many states uh, and jurisdictions. Uh, and all of that is gone now. All of that is gone. And it didn't happen magically. It's because this sense of equity, uh, this sense of justice, uh, which began, um, rightfully so, uh, with addressing the, the centuries-old concerns of Black Americans, um, uh, obviously uh, applied to, and should apply to all Americans. I'm afraid, however, <laughs> Laura, uh, that in the process of uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the broth of justice being spooned out to all people, uh, the, uh, and the, of course, you, know, you could say Black people prepared the recipe and uh, cook the broth, uh, we may not have gotten our fair share, okay? And so as a result, uh, we do see, um, you know, uh, you know the, the process going forward uh, for other people, and it should, uh, but we still see in two, 2020, 
in the 21st year of the 21st century, uh, we see disparities in healthcare, in, uh, in incarceration rates, as I've mentioned, in terms of employment, economic activity, education activity, wealth uh, accumulation, and so on, uh, that are so far out of line. Uh, with, which is what is the case for the uh, predominant white community, that we know that that, um, that justice that we're talking about, that equity that we're talking about, is far from having been achieved. And, um, and it should be, a, it, I think it would appear as a very special and, and pivotal time right now in American history where true systemic and institutional change uh, can be a tangible, tangible achievement and not just a dream. I'm always troubled uh, by you know, the fact that when people start talking about um, you know, Martin Luther King's dream, uh, it makes him sound like kind of like this uh, pie in the sky kind of, you know, just his head in the cloud dreamer. And in point, he was a very pragmatic and practical person. And if people read the entire speech, the March on Washington, and I was actually there as a 13 year old, um, the entire speech speaks you know, specifically to the fact that basically it could be boiled down to a term that we're all familiar with this, without justice, there's no peace. That's what he was saying. Okay, he spoke aspirationally of his dream, but he also said that there's a time, a present time, the time is now uh, for justice here in America. And I'm afraid that uh, as we are here some 57 years later, the time is still now. Okay, and so, uh, I, I, you know, at, with your guidance, Laura, you know, I've uh, tried to, you know, think about all of these uh, issues that we've talked about within the context of the here and now. Okay, uh, we're all familiar with the uh, book Love and Hate in the Time of Cholera, and so I did title this aspect of what we're talking about, Love and Hate in the Time of COVID-19. Because, you know, we look at pandemics, and I was a history major and still a student of history, I guess I always will be, and um, it's during times of pandemic and plague that some of the best and worst of human passions uh, come to light. Uh, compassion, charity, uh, caring for others. We see that in, in a heroic proportions takes place uh, during times of pandemic. We're seeing it right now in, turn, in the, in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic throughout these United States and the heroic things that not just uh, the healthcare workers who have been just magnificent, of course, but just quote, ordinary men and women and what we all have done and found ways of what we can do to be helpful to our fellow human beings. But of course, it also brings out some of the worst of human passions. And uh, one of the worst of those is hate. Now, and I'm going to go through a whole catalog of history with respect to this, but uh, during the bubonic plague in Europe, for example, Jews were singled out for persecution and, and violent attack and were killed in many instances, uh, not because of any real connection or even supposed connection between uh, the Jewish people and the actual bubonic plague, uh, but because you know, the, the plague gave, allowed uh, already existing anti-Semitic uh, uh, passions to come to light and people start looking for victims. And of course, we do know the anti-Semitism that already existed then still exists to this day. Um, but during this 21st um, century, though, and it's at the 21st year of the 21st century, however, we see Asian Americans being singled out for a violent attack here in this country, um, not because of any real connection uh, to the disease. There's certainly no scientific uh, you know, uh, rationale for this at all, but because it gives an outlet for anti-American racism that still exists in this country. And of course, we see the, uh, the, um, the president, I always refer to him with a, not a capital P, small p president of the United States, uh, has fanned those flames. And we see outrageous attacks, uh, you know, based on that. But we also see uh, that, um, you know, we also see, and I think what's, what's important here is that during times of stress, uh, whether it's the Great Depression or times of stress, the Great Plague of 2020, uh, we see the fissures, we see the cracks, we see the problems in society and the weaknesses in society, they're accentuated and stressed, and sometimes to a breaking point. And I would suggest that's where we are as a people, as a country uh, to this day. Now, we'll never know. Uh, whether if there was no cell phone video or uh, if it just, um, if, if, you know, we don't know what would happen if George Floyd uh, had been killed uh, without the uh, background of the pandemic. We don't know, okay? What we do know is that for whatever reason, the stress of the pandemic brought millions of people out in the street, not just to, um, and not, not just express that there's been a breaking point for their tolerism uh, for racism and institutional violence, not just for George Floyd, not just for Eric Gardner, 
not just for Tamir Rice, not just for, you kind of get the point, you know, Sandra Bland, you know, that not for just these one individual, these various individuals, because we can go back historically to Emmett Till, we can go his, back historically to the his, history of lynching in these United States, understand we've never had an anti-lynching bill passed in these United States, still, it's 2020. We still, we were never able to get it passed even during the time of the New Deal. We're never able to get it passed even during the time of the New Frontier. Never able to, able, ever able to get it passed even during the time of the Great Society and so on. Uh, but um, the point is that we clearly have reached an institutional breaking point because it's not about lynching anymore. It's about institutional violence and the various ways that it takes place. Because institutional violence is not just a cop with his, with his uh, knee on my neck. Institutional violence also has to do with inability to get financing for business. Institutional violence, it means that uh, my child can't go to the school uh, with, with a good enough education because we don't live in the right zip code. Institutional violence means that uh, you know, my life expectancy is less uh, than a white male at birth, uh, be only because of the accident at the birth. And uh, so, you know, we know that uh, all of these things kind of kind of have come to a, a, a boil. So. Um, we also, and what's important, I think, to understand right now, uh, Laura, is that whether there's a vaccine uh, that, that is put in place, and then we're going to have to worry about the anti-vax people saying they're not going to take the vaccine. So, we, you know, we, 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 Americans keep things interesting. But then there's a vaccine in place and people start to take it. You know, I've got to believe that there's changes that are already taking place uh, that are deep and unforeseen societal and institutional changes. And that despite uh, the natural opposition of what I'd term, the only thing term people who are white supremacists and nationalists who cling to this, what I can only call an atavistic belief uh, that their past dominance gives them some right to dominate in perpetuity. Uh, it, is the, it is the subset, it is the other side of the coin of make America great again, and Donald whistle the Donald whistle. Donald Trump does not speak with a dog whistle. Donald Trump speaks with a clarion, a klaxon horn, and and his, there are people who believe that. But if there's anything good about this pandemic, it's weakened American white supremacy to a point from which it can never recover if we remain vigilant as a national community. Uh, and you know, it is there's various things um, that take place. But we're going to focus uh, in the time that I have left uh, on this issue of racism and what can be done with respect to. Uh, the whole teaching and learning process, you know, because one of the things that, that I will mention, I'll mention it again now, is that uh, for all of this to be a teachable moment, two things have to happen. Laura. One, we have to have people who are willing to teach differently, teach the truth, uh, even if it's uncomfortable, teach, uh, you know, reality, uh, so that um, students will be able to have a better and different understanding of what what was going what what has been going on in country what is now going on in this country the second is you have to have willing students okay we all have to be willing to learn the truth about this country it may be uncomfortable okay but if you don't if you're not willing to learn then you can't possibly uh, be a part of change okay because the you know every every country has its myths so you know uh, whether it's King Arthur whether it's Napoleon uh, you know whether it's Bismarck or whether it's George Washington or Simon Bolivar or, you know, they, we, you know, all nations have their heroes, uh, and heroes uh, by virtue, you know, of reality, being human, are never perfect people, and this country is not perfect either. So when you say racism is a part of the American tradition from its outset, people get really cranky. You know, people get really upset, and they say, well, well we had the pilgrims, we had the huddled masses, you know, yearning to breathe free, and it said, yes, but keep in mind that this is a nation that, that is based on white Euro supremacy. Uh, what do I mean? When you steal land from people who have been living on the land for 10,000 years, you can only, it's only justified by, through, through this common notion of supremacy. And when you read, as I have the historical accounts, you know, basically, you know, the Europeans came and said, yeah, we, we know there's people here, but they're not doing anything with this. Or they're not doing what we would do with this land. Okay, uh, and so they got to go. Okay, and uh, there may have been anywhere but from eight to twelve million uh, indigenous people on the North American continent at the uh, in the you know fifteen hundreds, and by the eighteen hundreds they're down to less than a million. Okay, and uh, you know they in the process not only taking their land, destroying their culture. You can only do these things, and I think this is what's what's important. Uh, is you can only justify these things through some common notion of supremacy and the constant and the consequent. Um, uh, inferiority of the other. Okay, if I can think of you as the other, not like me, then I can do anything I want to you without guilt. Okay, without guilt and with a full understanding that you aren't 
you know, you are the other and others can be done, done this way. Indigenous people were the first to feel the lash of racism and they still feel it to this day. Black people were next in line, beginning with the importation of African slaves in 1619. Now, we have to understand that slavery has been around pretty much since humans have been around. So we got our knuckles off the ground and started walking around upright for more than five minutes. Uh, but race-based um, uh, race uh, slavery is a very different uh, kind of animal. Uh, because what race-based slavery, which is what was instituted here in this country, says is that not only will you always be a slave, but your child will always be a slave, and anybody who looks like you can only has have status as a slave, uh, because that is the lot in life of your people. And so that is why you can have, um, whether it's Jim Crow or lynching or other forms of disparity in health care, as I mentioned, housing, education, incarceration, and mortality rates, the list, unfortunately, is almost endless. Uh, um, the, many times people look at these disparities and say they're systemic and unrelated to racism, when in fact they most certainly are, unless you want to accept the notion of some inherent inferiority of black Americans, we have to accept the fact that uh, because of denial of opportunity or the removal of opportunity in many instances or any number of other ways in which it is just different being black in this country and somebody's gonna point to Jay-Z as a billionaire and LeBron James as a billionaire and Barack Obama became president of the United States, so what are you talking about? And what I'm talking about is the rest of black Americans uh, who, who um, definitely don't uh, you know share in those benefits? It has been shared benefits. We've had ex ex exceptional beneficiaries, and nobody would deny that. Uh, but that does not prove the point. That does not prove the point. And so um, it's it's uh, so you know what I'm what I'm saying right now is that um, you know racism doesn't wear a hood, always. It doesn't even always wear a police officer's uniform. Uh, and it's difficult for white Americans and difficult uh, for, to understand that. And it's, and it's difficult for black Americans who live it every day to have to explain it, you know, because people will say, well, I'm not racist. I don't have a, ra the best one is I don't see color. Okay, well, so if you don't see color, then you don't see me. Okay, uh, you know, because, you know, we do live, you know, we, we don't live in a monochromatic universe. And so, yes, of course you see color. And, but you're saying, I don't recognize that as being a differentiating factor in your experience from mine. And of course it is, you know, that you don't have to make judgments based on that. Uh, that's where we kind of get on this slippery slope we've been talking about. But it's important, I think, for people to understand that, um, you know, you have to call somebody racist. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, name calling is not the point. It's actions and deeds uh, that are important. But, um, you know, but we live in, as I said, in this teachable moment uh, because, you know, there's finally a recognition uh, that racism does not make a white person evil unless once understanding that it exists, they do nothing, you know? And I mean, I mean you know, you, you think of small things, big things. Um, they took, finally took Aunt Jemima off the pancake box after 120 years, Laura, you know? And it's like, well, 120 years of, you know, this is through Franklin Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King, and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama still have Aunt Jemima on the pancake box. You know, a black woman and Aunt Jemima, the history of Aunt Jemima who was, was a slave woman who baked pancakes, you know, kind of myth mythical woman, of course, but right along with Uncle Ben and some of these other characters that we see, you know, uh, on major Fortune 500 companies. And you don't see those kinds of images, uh, for, for goodness sake, you know, a character, you know, some vicious uh, anti-Semitic caricature of a Jewish person, you know, uh, you know, you know, in in, a, in an ad, and you shouldn't, you know, or on a, on a pancake box, or you know, a, I don't know. It doesn't matter, you know, the product. But I think you get. I hope our audience gets the idea. You don't see that being done with any of the people, and people are acting like, well, gee, we had a major accomplishment. We took, you know, Aunt Jemima off the pancake box. And Frank, I stopped buying Aunt Jemima a long time ago just because of that. But it's like, okay, on my list of the 50 things that black Americans need, Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben are probably like number 54, okay? Uh, you know, along with the Dixie Chicks changing their name and, you know, Lady Antebellum changing their name. is like, yeah, that's great. Uh, NASCAR is removing the Confederate flag. And understand the pushback that people get from all of these things, which is, which is you know, as interesting as anything else. But, you know, on to uh, the points that I get in the, in the time that we have left is that, you know, the fact that this is a teachable moment does not mean that teaching will take place. As I said, teachable moments require teachers who wish to teach and students who wish to learn. Okay, and uh, if the entire concept of systemic institutional racism is being in addressed, um, we're going to have to reformat our view of history and the actors in that history. 
you know, this, it doesn't take a lot of deep research, Laura, for people to find out that eight of the first 10 slave owners, except eight of the 10 first presidents uh, were slave owners. Okay, um, what does that mean? Okay, you know, we, you have to understand that um, you, anybody, we all have to understand that there were no good, um, there were no good slave owners, okay, and not to the slave. Okay, there were no good plantations, not to the slave. And so we have, so if you understand that eight of the 10 uh, presidents, first 10 presidents were slave owners, the only two that weren't were John Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams from Massachusetts, all the rest were from the South. You have to understand who they were. Uh, you know, they, uh, this country was built on the satanic twins of racism and white supremacy, and it's literally built into America's institutions. What do I mean by that? The White House was built with slave labor. Can we possibly imagine going to Germany and seeing some official uh, German building built with labor from the concentration camp inmates in World War II? The mere thought is disgusting, absolutely disgusting, but somehow we can excuse it when the subject is American racism. And I would point out also the American capital, um, you know, the, the big dome that we all see. You know, they, they, these were built with slave labor. And it's like, you know, yeah, we're really sorry about that. We're not going to change. We're not going to tear down the White House. We can't do that. OK, but but well, what are you going to do? You know, as I say, at least you can acknowledge the fact that that is the reality of America at this point. And, you know, we have to look at it differently. So it's going to be important to teach uncomfortable truths about American history. Uh, but not just simply to excoriate America. I mean, you can waste a lot of time doing that, but what's the path for re re true reconciliation and justice? Because there can't be any, but there can't be any path to reconciliation and justice um, with a, without acknowledgement of a crime in the first place. You know, and, you know I have friends who are doctors uh, and they all tell you, you don't have to be a doctor to know this, a yeah, doctor cannot treat a malady until it's acknowledged that a malady exists. Okay, you know, unless unless the doctor can understand that I have a broken leg and you can't fix a broken leg. There's a way to fix a broken leg once we understand the leg is broken. Okay, and if as a patient, and we can all think of ourselves as one massive 330 million person patient, we have understand that we have problems, we have systemic issues. Once we understand that we have them, then we can say, well, okay, what are, if not the cures, what are the ways to treat these? Okay, as I said, the first thing we have to do is we have to treat it with the truth, okay? Um, you know, because these teachable moments are not eternal. Um, and uh, like an unguarded flame, they can be extinguished uh, by winds of ignorance or indifference. And we certainly have the collective ability to learn from the grievous errors of this country and to become a better ed educated and more humane country. Uh, but to do that, uh, we have to, first of all, understand the history. Because once you understand that, and, and then you say, well, okay, you, you don't have all these arguments against so-called affirmative action. People say, well, you know, they're taking away an opportunity from me, you know, and I never owned any slaves. And they say, oh, well, fine, you never owned any slaves. But yeah, again, look at the history of this country to understand that its institutions from being a wooded, uh, you know, uh, land uh, with a sparse population to what we see now is this advanced, so-called advanced um, civilization with highways and airports and all this good stuff and internet and, and whatever that happened because you know there were people who had to be removed so we had genocide we had slavery uh, we had a lot of things that, that brought this into place and the people who uh, are the descendants of the victims of all of that you know deserve you know uh, you know deserve a break <laughs> you know that's a, that's that's what it is I mean you know, if I stand on your foot for uh, you know. You know, when the race starts, and then about uh, halfway through the race, I let your foot go. Yeah, you're probably not going to win the race. You know, you're just probably you're just not going to win the race. I don't care how fast you are. So, you know, we got to even the playing field. I think the expression is. And so, you know, this pushback against affirmative action, this pushback against saying, well, you know, we, we're treating, um, you know, everybody should be treated equally. It goes back to that race analogy. Yes, you know, everybody can be treated if we all start at the finish at the at the starting gate uh, with the same shoes the same training, uh, you know, and the, and the same chance to win. But that's not what this country is about. So we've got to figure out a way to change and play. And I've got to believe that people in, our, in, our, in, the, in your conference today and the American people in general, you know, can be very creative uh, when people put their mind to it. You know, people decide, yeah, you know, there's some ways to do this and it doesn't have to disadvantage me, you know, but in the, in the process of everybody getting a better advantage, we live in a better uh, country, a better place. And so I just would close by saying, you know, it's a personal decision for everybody. You know, we can make this a better educated and more humane country, but we need better teachers and we need better students.
There we Thank go. you very much, Professor Ford. That was a tour de force of, um, of some background and some really important things to think of. And I appreciate you highlighting the extreme need for us to lean into this conversation. And, you know, as you were speaking, one of the things that really leapt out to me was your comment that without justice, there is no peace. And I think we're all seeing the, the incredible turmoil that we're experiencing as a result of, you know, all of the um, tremendously unjust things that have happened. And that's layered on top of all of the tension and all of the fatigue that is already at place because of COVID. So if we can take a few minutes to talk through how to support these educators in having those conversations with their students. And I'll um, post in the, the chat space a resource that um, educators can use, which is called Teaching Tolerance. And one of the first things, you know, when I was reading through this Teaching Tolerance resource, um, they talk about the importance of doing some pre-work because I think with all of us feeling tired and, you know, having these conversations about racial un unrest, it can feel like a minefield. And I think that already that there's some pretty significant fear among educators around facilitating these conversations. And then we add in the fact that we're fatigued and we're feeling overwhelmed with COVID. So, you know, I'm incredibly mindful of, you know, all of the ways that you've highlighted the need for us to, to lean into these conversations and to, to have these conversations. My personal worry is how we can support educators feeling that they have the necessary resources to feel like they can do this you know, in this moment with this powder keg of emotions that we have. So, um, so that's some of my kind of background. Um, mm -hmm. And in the, the teaching tolerance um, resource, they say that, you know, a lot of the things that are included is, are pre-work, like kind of getting ready, getting your backpack, you know, filled with all the resources you need. And one of them is about assessing your own comfort level. You know, and it just goes through a really simple list. I would rather not talk about race or racism. I, you know, am very uncomfortable, usually uncomfortable, sometimes uncomfortable, up to I'm usually comfortable or I'm very comfortable. So do you have any, you know, thoughts around kind of that assessment? Have you seen things that have, have worked well to just help people shift into, you know, getting into that emotional space of, you know, helping facilitate those kinds of conversations? Yeah, well, we'll see. I, th I think that if people wait to get comfortable, uh, we're going to be waiting a long, long time, <laughs> you know, and so, but it's okay. You know, it's, it's one of the things, you know, I keep, I keep, you know, a theme in several presentations I've been making, but it's okay to be uncomfortable. Yes. It's okay to say, well, gee, you know, this is, well, this is tough to, you know, I mean, I, you know, learning is, you know, learning is not supposed to be comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, unless you just want to be ignorant for the rest of your life. And they, you know, that's very comfortable, you know, being ignorant. We've got enough of that going on in this country, mm -hmm. Lord knows. You know, so learning is not supposed to, it's, it's not supposed to be, you know, uh, you know torture, uh, but, you know, learning is, 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 is taking you from where you are to another place. And it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's, I think, understanding the need for it. It's not particularly comfortable to, it wasn't that comfortable to learn Latin uh, when I was a kid, uh, but I needed to learn Latin uh, because it was required for the schooling that I was doing. And so ultimately I became proficient in Latin, uh, but it wasn't comfortable at first at all. Uh, it was, you know, you know, you know, Lord knows um, uh, trigonometry was never comfortable. That's another story. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, it, it's okay. You know, I mean, Learning is so important uh, in, in terms of dealing with those comfort levels that you talked about. And that's an excellent question, um, Laura, because um, I was thinking about it in, in answer to your question. You know, there's a, a, not a very long book, and people are going to say, what are you talking about? Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet mm -hmm. Beecher Stowe. Uncle Tom's Cabin came out in the early 1850s and literally changed this country. Okay, why did it change this country? Because put aside all that you think you know about Uncle Tom's cabin. Uh, Uncle Tom, yeah, the term Uncle Tom is considered to be a pejorative term for black people who just kind of kowtow and bow down to white people. Uncle Tom 
in the book was actually a very strong character. Uncle Tom uh, was actually a very noble character and uh, someone who never could be broken. Uh, but what, what the book did, and it was, you know, and it was a bestseller, international bestseller, one first in history, uh, to be, uh, you know, because it portrayed black people as human beings. Mm -hmm. And when you read that book, when you read that book, and you and you would say if you put yourself in the purse in in the place of a white person in 1852, you know, saying, "My God, that could be me losing my child," mm -hmm. or you know, a black man saying, "My God, that could be me having my wife taken away from me," or "My God, that could be you know," and and it, because um, she portrayed you know black people as humans, not as caricatures, mm -hmm. and it, it's a great great story. And I would come, you know, it's, it's, you know, reading books like that, you'd say, well, what is that going to do? Um, it's, you know, it's going to do for, it did for me, certainly, but it's certainly going to do for people who are in that discomfort level that you talk about, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's that book or, you know, perhaps more current literature, I think. Uh, but, you know, understanding that, um, you know, that, that the, you know, you're dealing with humanity issues. And if you can, you know, once you can say, well, how would I feel if, and kind of fill in those blanks. How would I feel if every time my 10 year old son went out the door, I had to remind him what to do so he didn't get killed by the cops, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is literally what I had to do. He, his mother and I had to do, uh, he's now 23. I think he's got it figured out <laughs> at this point. But, you know, um, yeah, you, you know, white parents don't do that. They mm -hmm. don't do that. They tell them, you know, be respectful to the police and all that, but not, this is what you gotta do, make sure you don't get killed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I told you, know, some was taught to be respectful to everybody, that's for sure. Uh, but no, this is the part about, you know, self-preservation because mm -hmm. it's saying the wrong thing to the wrong cop at the wrong time can get you killed. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, so how would you feel if that's what you had to do with your son? You know, you've got to feel, damn, damn, this, this, we got to change this. This is just mm -hmm. ridiculous. Right. And, you yeah. know, because I know my, my son is, uh, you know, law abiding. He's polite, no courteous. How could he possibly get killed? Ask Tamir Rice's parents about that. Right. You know, you know, ask, you know, all the other, you know, black parents who've lost their children in just senseless encounters with the police. But it's that's just a subset of that. And, you know, I think um, it's not sympathy. Now, I was thinking about this before we, we began this session. It's not sympathy that I think is important. I think it's empathy. OK. You know, and sympathy is like, gee, I'm really sorry what happened to you. OK. Empathy is I know how you feel. Big difference. That's why our president right now has. He doesn't have the empathy wire in him. And so he can't, he just, he just, you can't, you almost can't criticize him because it's just not there. But I believe that most people of goodwill have that empathy wire. They just kind of, you know, that empathy gene, whatever you want to call it. But we have to, you know, I think expand on that. So that's a long answer uh, to your question, I know, Laura. But I think that it's, um, you know, I, I think if, if we depend on people being comfortable, then it's not mm -hmm. going to happen. I think right. it's a question of, of, of how do you address that discomfort? You address that discomfort by learning more. You know, mm -hmm. and then you're just not so uncomfortable. I, once I, you know, I mean, I've read a lot about the Holocaust over the years. And so I will never know how it felt to be a victim of the Holocaust. But I've read a lot about that, that time period. And so I understand at least the motivations um, that, that gave rise to the state of Israel. You know, and, and so I, there's a big you know, deal of discussion, <laughs> obviously, about the state of Israel and, and you know, the Palestinians. And all that. You, you know, you can at least understand you know, the origins, you know, the, the modern origins of the state of Israel, which is very different from Zionism in the 19th century, where we digress. You know, the point is that you can understand the modern origins of the state of the state of Israel, uh, because if you understood what people went through, um, I remember visiting Israel, uh, and uh, the, uh, um, they, have, they have a memorial uh, museum to um, the Holocaust, and they, they have a map, uh, which they show all of the towns and villages in Europe with more than, uh, like, 5,000 Jews living in there. And there's little red dots all over, all over the map, from France all the way over to Poland, every place in Russia and so on. And then they said, and this is what it looked like in 1945. There's like mm -hmm. five dots left. I mean, it's just amazing, right? Yeah. You know, so you, 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 you can understand it. So, so you, know, you know, maybe people ought to go to the museum, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, national, you know, the African American Museum in, um, uh, in Washington, D.C. and start on the ground floor. Uh, which mm -hmm. begins with slavery and work your way up from there. And maybe you start to understand, but you don't need to go to a museum. I think that's why, that's why they invented books, right? That's why they invented lots of uh, different, 12 Years a Slave is a movie, you watch that. And if you can watch that uh, as a black or white person and say, well, I, I just have no idea what the problem is with slavery, uh, then you probably just lack empathy. But I do think most people would understand. But I think education, education, mm -hmm. education. That's like we, have, we need teachers to be educated 
and we need students who are willing to learn. Exactly. Yes. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for this conversation. It was very okay. helpful. We're going to go ahead and open the, um, the floor up for, um, for Q&A. And if you have some questions that you'd like to share with um, Professor Ford, feel free to put them into the chat space because he'll be in the chat to be able to answer them there. And thank you so much, P Professor Ford. We really appreciate your perspective and we appreciate your time and spending with us. Oh, thank you, Laura, and regards to everyone in attendance, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Have a great conference. Absolutely. Take care.